Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul and welcome to yet another Red Game Nintendo.com video. In this, we're going to be covering the basics of what a CPU is and how it functions. What with all the excitement over AMD's Ryzen processors, a common question in comments is, well, what does this stuff actually mean? Regular viewers will know that I have intended to first put out a Nintendo Switch analysis, but due to a few additional details which have popped up over the past few days about the Switch, I need to do some further checking on the specs of the machine. So in the meanwhile, well, let's go through this. This video is to serve as a basic introduction of what a processor does and how it operates. But some of the more advanced functionality will need to be simplified or skipped. The purpose of this video is to get people on the same page and help you understand the more common technical terms and what they mean. So what is a processor? What does the processor actually do inside your computer? A CPU, central processing unit, has often been called as the computer's brain, and it is possibly the simplest way to describe it. A CPU runs using arithmetic, interpreting instructions from a computer program and fetching inputs from a user to allow a game or application to run. More modern processor designs have gotten considerably more complex over the years, and now, rather than a single processor core running at a paltry clock speed, handling simply one instruction at a time, by the way, an instruction might be as simple as what is the result of 1 plus 1, we're now creating multi-core processor behemoths, screaming at way past 4 GHz in each core running multiple instructions at once, and in different stages of their pipelines. But don't worry, we'll explain all of this in just a moment. So there's a big question, why did processors go multi-core rather than simply having higher clock speeds, such as 10 GHz or faster? Well, it mostly comes down to performance versus heat and power consumption. Quite simply, it's easier to develop a faster design by adding more cores as the process manufacturing sizes shrink than simply relying on clock speed only. Indeed, this was a lesson painfully learned by Intel in the early 2000s with its Pentium 4 netburst architecture. Originally, Intel had claimed that this then new architecture would be capable of running up to 10 GHz a figure which amazed those into computers at the time. But those claims were quickly quashed by reality, when the chips became far too hot. And despite attempts to redesign, and of course introduction of die shrinks, the top of the line Pentium 4s only reached about 3.8 GHz, which is a far cry from the original claims. Multicore also allows programmers to write applications which are more efficient, allowing for the creation of code designed to run on different cores for different tasks, and particularly important for games, for example. A thread can be dedicated as the organizer thread, which will schedule workloads across multiple other cores in the system. This has been a technique extremely popular with 8th generation consoles, as an example. We also need to clear up the so-called megahertz myth. This is a clock speed is only measured against a CPU of the same architecture. Therefore, pitting Pentium, uh, Intel's own Pentium 4 at 4 GHz against a newer generation of Skylake processor at the same clock speed, even if only one core and one thread was enabled, it simply would not be a contest. So we're going to attempt to tackle some of the reasons processors get faster in this very video. To put clock speed into some level of perspective, a 1 nanosecond is the cycle time for a 1 GHz CPU. And as one can imagine, this scales with clock speed. So, to use the same 4 GHz example as we just discussed, it would take just 0.25 nanoseconds to complete the cycle. The clock speed myth has died down quite a lot over the past few years, but this was particularly prevalent in the early 2000s when AMD were competing against Intel's Pentium 4 with their Athlon range of processors. This includes the Athlon 64, which brought 64-bit computing to the desktop. They were forced to adopt a PR rating, and therefore AMD's Athlon 64 Venice core, which was clocked at a seemingly paltry 1.8 GHz, had to be labelled as an Athlon 64 3000 for its PR rating for it to look competitive against Intel's equivalents. So, what is a processor pipeline? You might have heard of a pipeline before, particularly the basic five stages, and we'll get to what those are in just a moment. But first, why does the pipeline exist, and what are its stages for? In the very early days of processors, up until the 386, CPUs were really only capable of handling a single instruction at a time. There were a few exceptions, but we're going to be simplifying it for this video. 
So if a particular instruction took longer, nothing else could happen until it was finished running, and then the next instruction would begin its journey through the processor. But then came the 486, and with it bought more advanced pipelines, a whopping 8 kilobytes, yes, 8 kilobytes of on-chip level 1 cache. Cache, by the way, is a very fast area of memory, hold to use recently used instructions, we'll talk more about that later. Integrated floating point units and a few other bits and pieces. Too long, didn't read. It ran at about twice the speed, at, um, it put out twice the performance with the same clock speeds as the older 386 design, which is very impressive. So what are the processor pipeline stages? Well, this is where it gets tricky. And we're only going to be talking about the classic and basic five-stage pipeline because, frankly, it's sufficient for our purposes in this video. Fetch is an apt name. It retrieves a particular instruction from a computer's memory. A program is typically comprised of several million instructions, sometimes many more. And so it's imperative that the CPU keeps track of where these instructions are located within the computer's memory. It uses a PC, also known as Program Counter, to store each instruction's address. For a real-world example, 6 times 2 may be stored at, 12, at number 12, a street, a town, a postcode. 1 plus 1 may be stored at 33, a different street, a town over, and so on. And it will keep those um, instructions and the addresses, the requisite memory addresses, uh, in track at all times. Decode is when a programmer develops an application, they will all be using a different programming language, be they C Sharp, C++, Python. But the purpose of Decode is to translate the program's instruction, programming language, into a language that the CPU can actually understand itself. So to this end, a CPU translates the code from, say, C++ into assembly language, and then the computer can then run on binary code to do what it needs to do in the back end. Execute. So while this sounds nefarious, it is actually where the CPU does what the instruction tells it, which will usually involve its either the ALU, arithmetic logic units, which will perform mathematical calculations of varying complexity, be they integer, that would be a whole number, so say 1 plus 1, or a floating point, which may be 1.25 plus whatever, and move or perhaps move data from a different memory address or jump to a different memory address for the program. Then you've got memory access, which is the fourth stage. In this stage, if memory is required to be accessed, it will occur. For example, it might need to store or load memory uh, piece of data, or if there's a branch in the program, we'll get to that. It will update the program counter accordingly. We'll get to uh, branches in just a moment as well. Write back. Write back is where it will place the result of whatever the processor has calculated and stores it at the appropriate memory location. So modern processors typically have many more stages in the pipeline. For example, the Jaguar processor, which is found in both the Xbox One and the PS4, has about a dozen stages in its respective pipeline. Whereas CPUs from Intel or AMD's desktop, latest and greatest, have about 20-ish stages in their pipeline. I say 20-ish because it's sometimes a little more. But these stages are subdivided from the basic stages above. Therefore, the previous five can serve as a basic solid foundation for your knowledge. Okay, so one is prediction. In life, you're going to make decisions every day. Do you go with coffee or OJ for your breakfast? The train is standing room only that's just come in to the station. So, question, do you wait for the next one and risk being late or just saying, you know what, I'm just going to have to jump on this train and you'll have to just deal with standing for your morning commute? So imagine there are branches in the code. In C++, a simplified version of the code would look like this. With the if statement, it would be, you do get on the train, else you don't get on the train, you wait for it. Therefore, your day, your life would ever so slightly change. The problem with the code is that the pipeline flow to remain consistent, constant data must be uh, retrieved, executed, and written back in a smooth process with as few or ideally no breaks if possible. The purpose of branch prediction is for CPU circuitry to guess which is the correct way the code is going to branch. In theory, this will reduce pipeline stalls and keep the data flowing. So what happens if we guess wrong? 
Well, the performance impact is going to be relative to the number of stages in a in the processor's pipeline. As we discussed earlier, pipelines are at least 10 stages long generally now, while higher end CPUs are more like 20. Therefore, that particular CPU core's pipeline will have wasted, say, 20 CPU cycles. Branch prediction is a very super complex topic, and unfortunately we're only touching the surface of it here, because otherwise this video would end up being way too long. You might recall my New Horizon Ryzen uh, analysis pointed out that AMD's upcoming CPU will have a neural network, which is essentially the uh, Ryzen CPU learning the program and how it functions to better improve its prediction as it runs. But this is going to be a topic I'm going to have to tackle in depth in the future. So, you know, how much percent of a code branches and therefore how much prediction the code will require also depends upon the application. Even two games which would both run Unreal Engine 4 could possibly differ a little in branch prediction amount. There's a typical figure that's banded about, which is about 10% of code which will branch, meaning that correctly guessing the vast majority of code branches could save a hell of a lot of CPU cycles. But if we keep with games as an example, different areas and different situations will spice things up. For example, a cutscene will often have more stable workloads and more stable frame rate in many games. But where players can do anything in, let's say, an open world game, especially with destructible environments and a lot of physics, enemies, and therefore AI calculations, a lot more has to be taken into account, and workloads can vary greatly per scene. Hell, they can vary a lot just per frame. The length of a pipeline, the number of stages, is important, but so is the width of a pipeline. Essentially, it means the number of instructions that a pipeline can fetch simultaneously. Ryzen, according to AMD's own data, it's a six-wide design, very similar to Intel's Kaby Lake and Skylake processors. For this example, we're going to stick to a four-wide design simply because it's easier for mathematically for us to demonstrate what's going on. Quite often, you may get a bubble where one of the execution slots is not filled because a condition which is required from a previous instruction hasn't yet been met. A common reason for this is when a instruction needs to be fetched in a specific order and then a specific calculation that the CPU is waiting for has not yet been created. For example, A equals 1 plus 1, B equals 2 times 3, whereas C is the result of A plus B. So it's a very simple uh, example, but the end result we need to figure out is C. That's really the res important result. But if I told you what is A plus B, but I had not just told you what the question of A and B were, you wouldn't be able to answer. You'd be unable to do anything. And the same is true for computers. The CPU must say, well, okay, one plus one is two, and I will store that result in A, and then I will continue by doing uh, B, which is obviously two times three, and it will continue to do the math as it continues, uh, as, it, uh, as it progresses rather. Therefore, in the case of a four-wide design, in reality, the CPU will rarely see all four execution slots filled. But even if it does average three out of four, that's still better than a three-wide design, because the four-wide design can still, in some circumstances, hit four slots filled, and a three-wide design will still suffer from execution bubbles in what we just explained a few moments ago. So in other words, a free wide design might only get uh, two slots quite often filled. So what about threading? We've gone over multi-core processors. So what is a multi-threaded processor? Well, Intel often get the credit for bringing SMT, thanks to hyper-threading technology, to the humble desktop with their NetBurst Pentium 4 architecture. Other CPU, ma other CPU manufacturers have been tinkering with SMT for some time. The seventh generation consoles from both Microsoft and Sony also features SMT, with both the 360 and the PS3's main CPU capable of handling two main threads each. Each core, just to clarify. So, how does it work? Well, remember just a few moments ago, we went into the width of a pipeline and how you can get bubbles in those pipelines where there's no code to be executed. 
Well, in our four-way example, only three instructions were able to run at a time, just for example. Well, SMT attempts to fix this by pulling data from multiple sources at once. For example, the application you're using to watch this YouTube video in might provide one source of instructions, while Steam's update in the background is a second source of instructions. In theory, and yes, that's probably one of our most favorite terms here at RGT, this will ensure each CPU core is better maximized in its potential. It may seem contrary to your intuition, but assuming the application is taxing, let's say 3D rendering, you want each of the CPU cores to hit as close to 100% usage as possible. It means that the CPU is being fully used and the application is whizzing by as quickly as possible to finish its task. Sticking with Ryzen, since it's where most of our attention seems to be stuck on anyway, it marks AMD's first foray into SMT design. As of the time I'm putting this video together, it doesn't have an official name for its SMT, but it is rumored to be Threadripper, so we can, at least for the situation of this video, assume it to be true. The danger of two threads on the same CPU core, though, is that each thread can sometimes cannibalize and compete with the other thread for either execution time or resources, let's say cache. The benefit you'll see with SMT does vary on an application by application basis. In some cases, little to no difference, while others you'll see a nice jump in performance. At the time I'm recording this, Ryzen isn't publicly available. But, according to AMD, they have ample resources available on the CPU, including cache bandwidth and size, where each of the two threads shouldn't often conflict with one another. Naturally, you'll have to wait for a review. Hopefully, one from us if you've enjoyed this video before we can know for certain if this is true or not. There are multiple different types of cache on various chips, including instruction, data, level 1, level 2, and level 3 caches, and honestly, explaining what each of these do is quite challenging. But one of the common questions we receive regarding Ryzen's level 2 and level 3 caches is exclusivity. So I did want to put that into this video. The basic purpose of a CPU cache is for the CPU to not need to keep farming access out to main system memory each and every time it needs an instruction. It would introduce massive amounts of latency in the system and saturate memory buses. So a solution is a network of these caches which can be used for a variety of different tasks. We were mostly asked about the exclusivity, so here's the slightly longer winded explanation. A cache on chip has considerably faster access than main system RAM, which means data frequently stored instructions can be grabbed from the cache and then used by the CPU. Ryzen is built on four core modules known as CCX, CPU complexes. So an eight core 16 thread Ryzen CPU is really two modules essentially bolted together. To this end, each CCX has eight megabytes of level three cache, which is shared across the four cores, and each single core has 512 kilobytes of private cache, which will be split between the two threads. Remember, each core is SMT. While L2 cache is private, other cores can read from this cache, which is important in a multi-core slash thread environment. Level 3 cache, meanwhile, is shared between four cores, or eight threads, and it is touted as being mostly exclusive of level 2. What this means is the CPU will do its utmost to ensure there's no mirroring of data between the two caches. As data gets older, because it hasn't been used in a while, the CPU may decide to bump the data from level 2 to level 3, freeing up spe uh, precious space in the cache. There's no point in the duplicate data between the caches, because not only does it take up space, you also find that the data will become useless if you had a mirror, because let's say it updated the cache in level two and had the older copy of level three. Well, level three cache is then irrelevant because it's old data and it would cause errors. So what else? Well, as I'm the, right now, this video is about 20 minutes long and there's a hell of a lot of parts to the CPUs I've not covered. Associativity, risk versus CISC, CPU instructions, and probably about a billion other things which are going to be pointed out to me in the comments. Modern processes are just extremely complex, and this video is only 
intended to give you at least a basic rudimentary understanding of how they didn't uh, how they work are too long didn't read cpus have gone from several thousand transistors to now millions and now billions and don't even get me started on the complexities of gpus we can talk about these topics in the future though right i wanted this video to serve as an introduction and i think it's probably done a pretty good job of that so thank you very much for watching and supporting the channel if you can leave a like or perhaps share this video with your friends and cohorts that would be greatly appreciated and if this video does get well received i'll certainly put out more where we can go more in depth into the various aspects of cpus gpus and so on i say that we learn together sounds like a top idea with that said take care of yourselves bye for now